I love cycle syncing. I actually think that's the most important thing that anyone can start doing today to take their health into their own hands and start to gain body literacy is by starting, you know, starting small if it seems intimidating and download an app where you can at least track your cycle. So you know what cycle day you're on and you know when your last period was. I think that's, let's start there. Welcome to the Wise Consumer Podcast, the answer to your eco-friendly and healthy lifestyle questions. How to reduce your exposure to harmful chemicals, whether or not it's normal to have a painful period, how to live an eco-friendly lifestyle on a budget, and more. With the help of experts, I'm talking scientists, toxicologists, endocrinologists, cosmetic chemists. You'll get knowledge and know-how to your most pressing health concerns and sustainability questions straight from the source. I'm Madeline Weiskup, your host, confidant, and in-house science nerd here on a mission to help empower, inspire, and support you in your own health and eco journey. Because friend, I am a firm believer that if you don't feel good, you can't do good. So pour yourself a cup of tea, kick off your shoes, take a deep breath, and let's get started. Over the last few years, I've learned more about my hormones than I have in my entire life, or at least since I first started menstruating, okay? Let's leave it at that. But honestly, I wish the information I now know about my menstrual cycle and how my hormones impact my everyday life had been made available to me years ago. So many unpleasant hormonal symptoms, ladies, you know what I'm talking about. Painful periods, mood swings, heavy bleeding, fatigue, bloating, delayed periods, period poops, skipped periods, the list goes on could have been avoided or at least managed with more ease had I been more aware of how my hormones impacted my overall health. So here to help us clarify, break down a few things, and to explore the ins and outs of hormone health is the period guru herself, the one and only Jenna Longoria. Jenna is a board-certified functional nutrition practitioner who specializes in women's hormones. Having herself experienced severe hormonal imbalances throughout most of her life, today Jenna is on a mission to help other women reclaim their hormone and digestive health as well. If you've ever wondered what your period blood color means or why it matters, how to cycle sync, why ovulation is so important, or struggle with hormonal imbalances such as PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, then this is an episode you don't want to miss. I should also share that while Jenna and I, of course, chat about all things hormones, we also take time to explore the winding journey that led her here and the unfortunate hardship she's faced over the last year after the tragic passing of her husband and how she's found the courage and strength to persevere. Jenna is truly an inspiration to so many women, and I am honored to share her work, story, and knowledge with all of you today. It was such a pleasure chatting and learning from Jenna, and I know you're going to love this conversation. So without further ado, let's get started. Hey, Jenna, thank you so much for being here. Hey, Madeline, thank you so much for having me on today. I am so looking forward to this conversation. So thank you so much for taking the time to share your wisdom and your knowledge with all of us. Happy to be here and chat. Awesome. I want to start off with um, where you're calling me from, only because I'm extremely jealous. And for my listeners who may not be following (laughs) you, I would love for you to share where are you calling me from and how you got to where you are today. Let's start with that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I am currently, I am living now. I just moved a few months ago to Italy uh, on the Amalfi Coast. So in Southern Italy in a small town called Positano, and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's probably the prettiest place I've ever been to in my life. And uh, I'm currently, you know, my office view is the Amalfi Coast. Oh I can gosh. see every day. So it's, uh, I feel very blessed to be here. Um, but I did just move here. I was living in the U.S. Uh, for, uh, I guess, three years prior to that. And then a, a year in between a limbo during COVID uh, last year. Uh, my husband passed away in February of last mm-hmm. year. And uh, after that, uh, I went to go visit his family in England. Mm-hmm. And when I left for England, the next day, the lockdown started. 
So I was the only American, like the last American left into uh, the EU. Uh, UK was still the EU last year. And Mm -hmm. I just was there all year long, kind of just bouncing around. And when things opened up again in July or June, I took a train from London after staying with my in-laws for four months. I took a train to Amsterdam all the way down through Europe to Italy and really just fell in love with it here and decided to create a new life. That's awesome. So you were in the U.S. prior to this, correct? And now you're in Italy. But before that, then you were in the U.K. Yes, just for in between, just kind of, you know, after Dom passed, uh, you know, went to England to have his uh, a memorial there. We had one for him in Houston where we were living in Texas. Mm-hmm. And uh, then COVID happened, which we all we still haven't had his English memorial. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just, you know, it, it actually was a, I look back at it and I'm actually very grateful for the lockdown mm-hmm. because my plans after Dom died, since I work online, mm-hmm. you know, I was like, I can work anywhere. And I wanted to go to Australia and practice with my teacher. I, I, I practice a, a Ashtanga yoga mm-hmm. and my teacher is in Australia. And so I had an Airbnb booked for a month. I was going to just jump into it right after his memorial at Dom's Memorial. And, uh, you know, I didn't get to go. And instead spent three months living with my sister-in-law, her wife, and um, their little one, Lucas, who was like a year and a half, my Mm -hmm. nephew. And it was just a beautiful time just to all be together and connect and grieve together as a family. And the whole world kind of just stopped moving Mm -hmm. the lockdown. So I felt everyone was grieving with me in a way. And it was such a beautiful time that I would have never gotten if the lockdown hadn't happened. I would have just been running to travel, which might have been kind of escaping from the reality that I had just lost mm-hmm. my husband. So I got to sit with that. And I feel that those three months of lockdown grieving my husband were like a year's worth of normal grieving, mm-hmm. to be honest. Mm-hmm. I uh, worked through a lot. It was the most difficult thing I've ever gone through in my life, ever. And, uh, but I am so much stronger and I'm a better human being because of it. So I'm in the long run. I know it's really strange to say you're grateful Mm -hmm. (laughs) after your husband passes away. It's definitely not what I wished for, Mm -hmm. but I believe that what happens is what is supposed to happen. And we can either use it as a learning experience and an opportunity for growth and to help other people in this world through what we've learned, or we can just sit and wallow and be a victim and we all have the potential to do either one. I don't believe that some people just are weak and are victims and other people aren't. Mm-hmm. I think we all have the capability to overcome. Yeah, I'm so sorry. And and thank you for sharing. I know that's been a hard journey and you've shared a little bit about it, about it on social media. And it just really, it tugs at my heart for you. Um, and I appreciate you sharing because I know a lot of people, especially even with COVID, you know, I had family members who passed with COVID randomly, you know, so it's just been a really tough year and, um, there is a lot of grief. So I think a lot of people can relate to each other right now. And I appreciate you sharing. Um, I, I, I am in awe of how you have come. I'm not, you're not out of it. I feel like grief is an ongoing thing that just kind of sits with us mm-hmm. for a long time. So I don't want to say like you're out of it, but you are, I, I am amazed at how you are growing through this from, and, and we're complete strangers. So I'm just like tracking you <laughs> on social media. And this is a very honest conversation with someone I've never met in real life. But um, it's just very inspiring to me to see how you grow and you take things that have been given to you and you are still helping so many women um, through your content and your voice and even through your grieving journey. So I really want to, you know, acknowledge and, and, um, honor you for that, Jenna. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, it really, it means a lot. So thank you. Yeah. Um, and I, I love the work you're doing and it's just so empowering and impactful and, um, I, I want to switch gears a little bit because I think a lot of the work, I mean, your journey, your story on its own is all interwoven, in my opinion. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but even through, if you could start with, you know, your PCOS journey and kind of how it led you here and um, how you've healed yourself and how it got you to the work you're doing as well. Absolutely. You know, I, I believe our pain is our purpose. Mm-hmm. And I had a lot of difficulties and pain with my menstrual cycle and my health growing up. I have polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS and endometriosis. 
so when I started menstruating around 14, I just had a lot of issues, uh, you know, pain and um, ovarian cysts mm. and just a lot, a lot of health issues. And, you know, I had insulin resistance that they didn't tie to PCOS. So they just told me to go on the birth control pill at about two months shy of 15. And so, you know, we didn't really know what we know now about PCOS and endometriosis. And to be honest, flash forward this many years, you know, we're sadly women are still getting similar treatment from their doctors and being medically glasslit, not getting diagnoses. I wish a lot of things would have, would, I, would, I wish they think things have changed more, but they haven't. Yeah. And so I was on the birth control pill for like a decade. And with the birth control pill, I had a lot of symptoms. I was one of those women who uh, got severe depression after taking the pill. Mm -hmm. So I went from like this, this teenager that loved to go, that loved to play sports. I was in a debate team. I liked to act. I was, I was in theater. Um, I was, I was basically just very out there and charismatic. And I turned into this person that had anxiety to go on stage, uh, dropped out of sports, just wanted to be in my room and read all day long. Which, there's nothing wrong with that, but that just wasn't who I was. Yeah. And I got really depressed. The doctors put me on Prozac. About a year later, I gained even more weight because Prozac tends to make you gain weight. And the pill also makes insulin resistance worse. So I gained even more weight. And it just was horrible. And so in my early 20s, I just had this idea. I don't know, the divine intervention just was like, stop taking the pill. And I had no reason to back it no nothing to validate it but I did start stop taking the pill and I had a lot of symptoms because well you know obviously my body right. hadn't been ovulating my hormones hadn't been working for myself for 10 years and it, it had been masking all these symptoms and now here they were full blown so you, you know I could address them it's kind of like if you have you know trauma in your life and if you don't address the trauma and you never go to therapy you never address it it's still there yeah and until you, and, and to address that, you're going to have to meet it face off, face forward, you know, and, and that's going to be difficult. And that's kind of like what it's like getting off the birth control pill. So a lot of issues that doctors just wanted to put me back on birth control. And uh, I decided not to. And later on, I decided to, you know, reroute my focus. I was in politics, journalism. I was living in Washington, D.C. as an associate producer. I decided that I just didn't want to make a difference in the world that way. Mm. It was just to me, just all fake. And I decided to just to, to be honest, go into nutrition to help myself to heal my body naturally, because no one was giving me the answers that I deserved. And when I did, I, I decided I realized that a lot of other women were trying to, you know, ask me advice. And you know, how did you do this? And then I was like, Hey, you know what, this is my calling. This is what I'm supposed to do. So that's what I do now as a period guru. And um, I love it. Yeah, I can tell you love it. And I love the content you're sharing. It's just so beneficial and so helpful. And I think you're right. It's been interesting as I've been going through my own fertility journey and bringing on guests such as yourself I, out of the woodwork, women are coming out saying like they, they have these questions they want me to pose to my guests and topics. Are you going to cover this topic? And it's just so interesting. And it's very illuminating to me to realize like how little we actually know about what's happening in our bodies and how to best support our bodies. So it's been really eye-opening for me to talk to women such as yourself and to read books and to explore this topic on my own as I go through my own fertility journey. Um, one of the things that I have actually kind of explored, and I think a lot of women and most of my listeners here are women, so we'll say a lot of the women probably have similar questions, is we understand what happens you know, throughout the month to our cycle, but there's like a lot of hormones that impact what happens to our egg throughout its little journey from, you know, our, you know, our, our ovary into the period, um, the shedding mm -hmm. of the uterine lining. So I would love for you to, if possible, give us a, like a mm -hmm. 101, this is what happens for your little egg as it's making its journey <laughs> through your body every month. Because I think a lot of us don't really know what's happening and or how hormones play into that. Yeah, absolutely. So it really, if you think about the whole journey with our periods and ovulation, you know, ovulation is the most important aspect of the menstrual cycle. When I say menstrual cycle, that's the whole event from day one, which is the first day of your bleed to the day before your next bleed. And that's typically between 25 to 36 days. So what's happening during this whole event is we have this orchestra of hormones that are ebbing and flowing. And it's a communication between our brain and our ovaries. So we have the hypothalamus, pituitary ovarian axis. 
So think about it like a game of telephone. So our hypothalamus will signal the, the, the pituitary gland to make the hormones, um, follicle stimul stimulating hormone FSH and luteinizing hormone LH. And that tells the ovaries to, um, to ovulate. It stimulates the follicles on our ovaries. So we have all of these little follicles, mm. which are eggs and potential, right? And it stimulates the, the follicles, which makes estrogen which is how we get most of our estrogen. And then one of those follicles is going to win. So it's kind of like hunger games. It's like the race to the win, you know? So one of, one of those follicles is going to win and become the, become the, the chosen one that ovulates and an egg is released. So in order for that to happen, that game of telephone from our brain to our ovaries, we have to be our, our we have to be healthy. We have mm -hmm. to be working properly. So if we have something like too much stress, where, whether it be environmental, emotional, internal, um, like gut infections or things like that, or food sensitivities, then it can shut off that process because our body realizes, Hey, there's something wrong in the environment. This isn't a safe environment for offspring. So we just need to shut off fertility because our body will always prioritize fertility, um, survival over fertility. Right. So it's much more than just this period. It's like our, everything is working together. So um, once that happens and the egg is released from our ovary, then we start to make something called progesterone. So the, um, we ovulate, but what's left over from the follicle is something called the corpus luteum, which is a, a gland that we make overnight, which is incredible that as women, we can make this <laughs> gland overnight that secretes progesterone for the second half of our menstrual cycle. Yeah. So think about it. We have two main hormones, really dominant hormones for simplicity sake, estrogen, which is the rock star of the follicular phase. Follicular phase is before ovulation. So think follicular, that's when your follicles are starting to grow and then ovulation. And then after ovulation, we have luteal. Mm -hmm. And in the luteal, the rock star hormone is progesterone. Progesterone is really important because it is what keeps our uterine lining. Um, uh, it, it keeps it nice and soft and for, and keeps our endometrial lining intact for a possible pregnancy. So if you're trying to get pregnant, you really want to make sure you have enough progesterone. Even if you don't want to get pregnant, you want to have enough progesterone because it nourishes our thyroid our hair, our heart or nails or brain. Uh, it's the, 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 you know, Zen, it, it, it makes us Zen. It's the, you know, nature's chill pill. Uh -huh. And then once those progesterone levels start to drop towards the end of our cycle, our endometrial lining sheds and we start our bleed. And then the whole event starts again. Thank you so much for explaining that because I think that's so important for women or, or menstrual indivi menstruating individuals to understand like what is happening. And that's a perfect definition. So thank you. Um, You're welcome. Another question I have to follow up on that, something that I come across a lot is, is um, individuals talk about, you know, you want a healthy egg. But I guess I'm confused, like, what exactly does that mean to have a healthy egg? Mm -hmm. And how do you know and or get a healthy egg? That's a great question. And, you know, the health of our egg really starts as a 90 day journey. So what we do 90 days ago is going to dictate the health of our egg today that we release in the cycle and things like oxidative stress can deteriorate the quality of the egg. So oxidative stress, Think about uh, if you bite into an apple and you leave it on the counter and it turns brown, that's oxidation. We don't want that happening inside mm. to our cells, to our DNA, to our ovaries. Um, so what we need is antioxidants in order for, to protect our eggs. And, you know, antioxidants, we can get, you know, colorful food. We get antioxidants. Um, other things that are really high in antioxidants are um, some supplements are like CoQ10, uh, which is really great for fert fertility health. Um, uh, glutathione is also really excellent for, um, you know, for protecting our ovarian reserve, um, as well as fish oil, vitamin E. These are all antioxidants that can help preserve our ovarian health. Mm. So that's really what we can do in order to preserve those also nourishing, you know, we are what we eat. So making sure that we're getting enough nutrients from our food, making sure that we're getting enough, especially minerals, minerals play an important role. So the, the, the top ones would be magnesium, zinc, um, iodine, selenium. So making sure that we're getting enough of these in our body, which most of us are deficient in minerals because our food supply has kind of become degraded thanks to, you know, monoculture and factory farming. So um, sometimes we have to actively search for foods to get these minerals, you know, bone broth, collagen is a great one for minerals. Uh, Celtic sea salt is excellent mm -hmm. for minerals. 
Um, but uh, potassium is another important one too. So making sure that we're getting all of these important minerals by eating a nutrient dense diet, taking care of ourselves really impacts our ovarian health. That's awesome. And and so how do we know if it is a healthy egg or not? Or is that just our hormones kind of let us know? Yeah. So, well, by charting our cycles, mm -hmm. and I'm sure we're going to dive into that more later today, we can understand if our period is healthy or not. So a menstrual cycle, because yeah. a period is just the bleed. So the menstrual cycle, the whole menstrual cycle. So here are some signs that maybe they're your, your, um, your, the egg that you released that month might not have been the best quality could be a short luteal phase. So luteal phase, remember is, is everything post ovulation. We really want it to be at least 12 days. Now, if you're having a seven, eight day luteal phase, something short, mm -hmm. then it could mean that that egg that you released wasn't able to make enough, that corpus luteum wasn't able to make enough progesterone. So there could have been a quality problem with the egg, but alternatively, it can also be just a stress issue. Um, and it's, it's your body's way of saying, Hey, you're not getting enough nutrients or you're not getting enough downtime or you're not getting enough sleep or water, these things. So that's one way you can kind of tell, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, painful, painful periods as well, you know, are a sign that something's going on. You know, if you have a lot of inflammation, you're going to have really painful periods. Yeah. So that's also a sign that there's some type of issue that needs to be investigated. Okay, super helpful. And another thing to piggyback off of this is um, period color. That's something that I've come mm. across a lot. And I was hoping we could talk about that as well, because mm. I think that's super interesting and something I wasn't aware of until I really started exploring this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and my guess is, again, most of my listeners aren't really familiar with this. So can you share a little bit about what we should be looking for, what different colors mean? Um, and if something's out of sync, how, what should we, what are the next steps? Yeah, absolutely. So that's another sign. Uh, our period blood is, is an indicator of our health as well. So really what we're looking for in a, in a normal, healthy period is uh, blood that's the color of bright cream as a bright cranberry red. It's a consistency of maple syrup. And that's what we're aiming for. So if we have blood that's maybe dark purple, dark blue with lots of clots, mm -hmm. that could signify, you know, an issue with a gut infection, um, estrogen problems, estrogen clearance problems, high estrogen. Um, if we have really light blood that's pink, that's not very dark red, that's light, barely there, that could signify low progesterone. Um, so, you know, cortisol issues, stress hormone issues, low progesterone, um, so, which indicates there's some type of stress going on in the body or, you know, deficiencies, mm -hmm. uh, thyroid issues. It could even, could even point to thyroid issues. Dark brown blood is blood that, you know, sometimes you see before and after your bleed and that's just oxidized blood that didn't get out from, if it starts in the beginning, usually from your last or previous cycle. And, you know, we don't want to see that too much. You don't mm -hmm. want to have a lot of, you know, occasional cycle is okay, but that means that the energy is not flowing, that there's some stagnation in the uterus. So acupuncture would be really great for that mm -hmm. uh, exercise movement, anything that kind of moves the pelvic floor and, and, and the body like yoga, Pilates, things like that, um, dancing. So, you know, they give us more clues than we think also how heavy or light you're bleeding. You know, if you're bleeding too much, that can signify anything over 80 milliliters is too much. That's on the high end. Um, you know, the average really is about 50 milliliters we're looking for. So if you have too much blood, that could also signify some infections or estrogen problems too little you know, low progesterone or thyroid. So there's a lot of data that we can get from, from just, you know, charting our cycles and noting the color of our menstrual blood. Yeah. That's so fast. Don't you wish you had had this when you were 15 years old? Like someone that you, exactly. don't you wish you could be you when you were like 15, <laughs> you know? I mean, the, the heartache so many of us go through when we're told, well, just get on the pill, because that's what I was told. That's what a lot of my girlfriends who are, and I want to talk about PCOS in more detail, because a lot of my girlfriends and listeners are reaching out and saying like, oh, I have PCOS. Is this a topic mm -hmm. you're going to be covering? Which is why I'm so excited to chat with you, um, because it, it, uh, most of us just got on the pill. That was the like, here's the Band-Aid solution. Um, when all this other stuff could have been diagnosed, had we known or had we been able to work with someone such as yourself who could say like, all right, this is what's happening. Let's look at your hormones and let's see what we can fix, you know? 
Absolutely. It's definitely a language that we should have been taught much earlier um, because the more that we're versed in reading the signs from our bodies and we can really be empowered to take, yeah. to be in charge of our own health, you yeah. know, obviously it's not, not outsourcing, not taking away, they don't not, it doesn't mean we would never go to the doctor, Correct. but we would have some more, we would be more empowered to know what's going on with our bodies and have these cues um, instead of waiting to go to the doctor when things are really wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? And I shared this in another episode, um, but this was this was really my aha moment for understanding my hormones is I, I had a miscarriage, but I knew um, that I was low progesterone only because I had been reading about luteal phases right before I got pregnant. And I mm-hmm. started doing the math and I was like, my luteal phase is like nine days. And so mm-hmm. when I, I called the doctor immediately as soon as I found out, and I was like, I'd like to get my progesterone tested because I'm worried that I have low progesterone. And they said, we don't test that. Like, that's not something we test. And I said, no, I really wow. would like to test my progesterone. I've been reading about luteal phases. So my doctor was like, okay, fine. Let's let's go ahead and test it. And my progesterone was extremely low. That So low that she decided right then and there, just give me a shot in, the, in, in my ass and be like, here's a progesterone booster. Unfortunately, I did lose the pregnancy. Whether or not it was because of my progesterone issues or not, I'll never know. It could have been something completely different. But that was where I was like, this is real. Like you have to understand mm-hmm. like how and what's happening in your body and to be able to advocate for yourself. Um, mm-hmm. It's, 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 it's been eye opening to me. So, so yeah, anyway, to shift gears a little bit, going back to the PCOS. So a lot of my friends, as I mentioned, and um, audience members are coming out of the woodwork saying like, we have PCOS. Mm-hmm. I'm not very familiar with PCOS, to be honest. Um, it's not mm-hmm. my specialty. And I would love for you to explain a little bit, uh, what is PCOS? Um, and, and, and how can we go about if we think we have PCOS to work with our doctors? And what are the next steps? Who do we talk to, etc.? Absolutely. So PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, is a, it's a syndrome because there are many different symptoms. So when, mm. it, when we call a syndrome that when there's like an umbrella of symptoms. And so that's why PCOS could look different for you or your friend mm. or me, you know, like we all have different symptoms. And some of those symptoms are insulin resistance, weight gain, um, anovulatory cycles, um, you know, male pattern baldness, hair growth in places uh, like on, on, uh, that you don't want hair, unfortunately, like your chin, your chest. Um, these are all different types of uh, mood swings, anxiety, mm. you know, these are all PCOS symptoms, blood sugar dysregulation. So, uh, you know, used to, there was this kind of myth that you had to be overweight to have PCOS, yeah. which is not true. You know, a lot of women are turned away from their doctors. Oh no, you don't have PCOS. You're not overweight. So <laughs> that's a, that's false. You don't have to be overweight to have PCOS. And what really, you know, it's a misleading name because not all women with PCOS have polycystic ovaries and not all women with polycystic ovaries have PCOS. That's why you can't be diagnosed with an ultrasound alone because um, it's typical for women to have a few uh, cycles with, um, you know, uh, you know, um, oh, little ovarian cysts. And they're actually not cysts, they're enlarged follicles. So you kind of think they're like the, like around your ovary, they look like a pearl necklace, these mm-hmm. pearl string. And that's actually just enlarged follicles or not cysts. And that's, it's common for women to have that in a few times in their lives. So if you went in to have an ultrasound and you happen to have that on your ovaries, the doctor could say, oh, you have PCOS. Um, luckily, they have set criteria now in order to be diagnosed with PCOS you need to have not only, you know, um, an ultrasound reading, but high androgens. So women with PCOS tend to have high androgens, so testosterone, DHEA, hormones on their um, hormone panels, which that's one of the reasons these high androgens can cause you to make more insulin and can cause you to have anovulatory cycles, which means you don't ovulate. So typically a woman with PCOS might not be ovulating every month. So maybe every 90 days or maybe every 120 days, um, it's not that they don't ovulate. They can ovulate at some point. It's just more of a challenge for them, which is why it's the leading fertility cha- you know, um, uh, problem for women because yeah. it, one in 10 women have PCOS 
and it's not being addressed because doctors just say, okay, we'll come back when you're ready to get pregnant. Like it's not important to ovulate before you're pregnant. And it is important to ovulate because we need to ovulate in order to make that hormone progesterone, which I just talked about earlier. You need to sustain a pregnancy, but you also need to be healthy for bone health, for, you know, for heart health, so many more things. Um, so what happens with PCOS is there's, there's a lot of different types, you know, insulin resistance driven PCOS and infl inflammatory uh, PCOS, adrenal PCOS, environmental PCOS. Mm. Basically, we still don't know everything about PCOS and what happens. There's some research showing that may, it, it actually starts in utero, uh, mother's uh, uh, exposure to to environmental toxins and BPA can cause this, but it's a metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. It's really look at it as a metabolic syndrome. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is a horrible name because ovarian cysts are just a symptom mm -hmm. of what's going on. Right. It's a metabolic syndrome that affects our bodies. A lot of us have insulin resistance. That's the most common um, factor in it. So that said, you're, you're right now, if you are diagnosed with PCOS, Usually your doctor is going to go one or two ways. The doctor is going to say, are you ready to get pregnant? And you'll say, okay, no, you're not ready to get pregnant. Okay. Take the birth control pill to yeah. regulate your cycles. Right. That's the worst advice ever because the pill has been shown in research to increase insulin resistance, which is already a problem. Insulin resistance for those of you listening just means that your body cannot bring insulin into your cells. The insulin does not go into your cells. And so your body makes uh, the glucose does not go in your cells. The insulin, think of the insulin, like a school bus for glucose to get into your cells so you can utilize it for energy. So you're making too much, your, your body makes more and more and more insulin to get glucose into your cells. Um, so it, what happens with the insulin resistance and weight gain, you know, blood sugar dysregulation, hypoglycemia, glycemic episodes, um, high androgens and ovulation. So your doctor may say, okay, well, get on the pill. That's really bad advice because as we just learned, it increases insulin resistance and it just silences the symptoms Yeah. because you go on about your daily life thinking, ah, oh, my symptoms are gone. So I don't have any problems anymore. I don't have PCOS. And so then let's just take the same woman and she decides five years later to get off the birth control pill to have babies. And it's a struggle for her because guess what? She never addressed the root cause. Right. Um, and so the other option the doctor might say is if, if your answer is, yes, I want to get pregnant. Well, they might give you some type of Clomid or, um, you know, a fertility drug that helps you help stimulate ovulation, which does have some side effects. There is a time and a place. My theory is my, my motto is just not jump to those. Mm -hmm. I feel like we should investigate other areas first, which we'll discuss. Um, and then if you have a more forward thinking doctor, and your answer was no, I don't want to get pregnant right now. Um, they might say, okay, let's put you on metformin. And metformin mm -hmm. is a drug that um, uh, increases insulin sensitivity. However, it comes with a lot of gastrointestinal side effects, like you know IBS symptoms. It depletes B vitamins, so your health is going to take a hit. Yeah. When there are actually better ways introducing, there are better ways to introduce to balance blood sugar, and that's diet and lifestyle. And PCOS really, in my opinion, the biggest factor in improving it and to see, to see lifelong changes is by implementing different diet and lifestyle strategies. Uh, PCOS sisters, we just, you know, require a little bit different, uh, you know, finesse to our plates and to designing our plates. It doesn't mean that we have to diet. It doesn't mean that we have to calorie count by any means. We just have to follow a few, another set of lingo when we're designing our meals. Um, and that is the most important part for me. And I put my PCOS into remission just through diet and lifestyle alone. And I've seen hundreds of my clients do it as well. Other women do it as well. So it's completely possible. So that's definitely where I would start if I had PCOS is I would find um, someone who could help you make the right dietary changes, take the uh, key supplements that can really help with PCOS mm -hmm. and, um, you know, see how that works for you. And then there's always fertility treatments and IVF and Clomid and all those things waiting for you after you've given that a whirl. And if it doesn't work. Yeah. What are some of the lifestyle and diet changes that you um, that have worked for you and that you can share with us? Yeah, for sure. Well, definitely um, eating more fat and protein and fiber. So getting fat, protein and fiber at each meal. 
um, not relying so heavily on carbohydrates because mm -hmm. carbohydrates for women with PCOS contend with insulin resistance. We tend to have a, you know, sugar overload. So it doesn't mean cut out carbs by any means, mm -hmm. but just not have like three servings of carbs with a meal, you know, mm -hmm. um, which I generally don't, and, and advice wouldn't say was good for anyone really, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, I, I think, uh, just making sure a keeping blood sugar balanced. Mm -hmm. So eating a healthy breakfast, eating fat, protein, and fiber at every serving, making sure you get enough protein, making sure you get a blood sugar balancing afternoon snack. P women with PCOS might need to snack more often than women without PCOS. Um, a vegetarian diet would be horrible for a woman with PCOS. I know I tried it. I did that in the vegan mm -hmm. diet for almost a decade. And it was mm -hmm. the worst thing ever because mm -hmm. we are already prone to insulin resistance and vegetarian diets are very high in legumes and grains. I'm not saying the vegetarian diet is bad, mm -hmm. but for women with PCOS, we just thrive more with animal protein, mm -hmm. quality animal protein and fewer carbs. So that would definitely be um, some of the best diet advice, you know, nutrition tips for women with PCOS. And then there are some key supplements that really help us. Um, zinc helps lower um, androgens and helps ovarian health. Um, ovocetol is this uh, a beautiful supplement that's a blend of myo inositol and inositol, which is a form of B vitamin that helps us. Um, it helps, it, it actually in studies is shown to be just as effective as metformin mm. at lowering insulin wow. uh, resistance. And that's a really great supplement for, uh, for women with PCOS. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are in our control. I believe in epigenetics, which means that we control our genes. We influence our genes or our environment. So our genes are not our destiny. So we just can flip that switch on or off. If you have the PCOS, PCOS gene, we'll just flip it off. That's mm -hmm. all. Just got to flip it off. That's amazing. So let's say that we, uh, what, who do we work with? Like, do we work with someone like you? I, I would never recommend someone like, just take all of these supplements and try this out. Yeah, I, yeah. I, you know, they should work with someone such as yourself. So, so someone who maybe is looking, how do they work with you? How, who do they work with? Yeah. So there's a, you know, myself is one, I have some colleagues as well. There's a lot of us out there. Um, I would look for someone who, first of all, I would look for, you know, nutritionist, dietitian, and someone that specializes in what you have. So if you have PCOS, someone who specializes in PCOS right. or even has it themselves, right. which generally the ones like me who specialize in PCOS is because we have PCOS and we know what works because we've done it for ourselves as well. Um, so yeah, I would definitely look into, you know, someone who understands that mm -hmm. because it's a definitely more complex issue than just going to any nutritionist in your town or whatever, who's just helping people generally like lose weight or, right. um, has certain fitness goals. Our, our goals are a little bit different when we have PCOS. We're really trying to balance our hormones, which are, uh, complex. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you're working with someone who doesn't specialize in those, and doesn't understand that, then, you know, you'll make some progress, but I think you'll hit a plateau and you won't really find exactly the support that you're looking for. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. And I highly recommend working with specialists. I am charting my cycle right now and I'm mm -hmm. working with on the Creighton model and I did not even realize, and this is why I think work with someone because I have a, a relatively good understanding, but as I'm charting, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much that I don't understand that I have to reach out to my specialist, if you will, to be like, okay, so what does that mean? Or what does this mean? And mm -hmm. that's why I think it's really important to work with someone, like you said, who understands like this works, this doesn't work. If that doesn't work, try this or let's add that supplement. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's really important to, to highlight that. Um, you also mm -hmm. mentioned lifestyle changes and I'm huge in cycle syncing. Um, and understanding, you know, like, okay, well, if it's your follicular phase and you're, you're, you know, you're, 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 like you said, the power estrogen is there, like you tend to have more energy, whereas your luteal phase or progesterone. So you're like, like you said, it's like the chill hormone. So do mm -hmm. you cycle sync or for anyone listening who doesn't know what that is, what, how do you define it? What are tips you can share around that? I love cycle syncing. I actually think that's the most important thing that anyone can start doing today to mm. take their health into their own hands and start to gain body literacy is by starting, you know, starting small, if it seems intimidating and download an app where you can at least track your cycle. So you know what cycle day you're on and yeah. you know when you're how, when your last period was, I think that's, let's start there, you know, download an app like Kendara. I love Kendara. Um, and then when someone asks you, when was your last period? You can actually look, you can see, you know, what cycle day you're on, um, take it up a notch. And then you start to track your fertility signs. 
So remember, an app cannot predict, an app only predicts when you ovulate. It doesn't tell you when you ovulate. Right. And chances are it's wrong anyway, because most women don't ovulate on day 14. And just because you have a 28 day cycle doesn't mean you ovulated on four, day 14, you know? So um, you can then take it up a notch, start tracking your fertility signs. And our three fertility signs are basal body temperature, uh, cervical mucus, and cervical position. Um, most people tend to just track basal body temperature and cervical fluid mucus uh, used interchangeably. And so um, what happens is after we ovulate, our temperature spikes and it remains elevated until we menstruate again. So it, BBT basically confirms ovulation, mm. whereas cervical mucus um, shows you that you're gearing up towards ovulation. You have an increase in cervical mucus, uh, in more wetness, uh, more fluidity. It, once you're about to ovulate, it looks like clear, like, a, like an egg white, and it stretches between your fingers. Um, that means you are fertile. You know, you have to assume you're fertile when you have uh, cervical fluid after ovulation, ideally that dries up mm -hmm. and then you have the confirmation with your BBT that it's elevated and then you're not fertile anymore. You can't get pregnant after you ovulate after 24 hours, you can't get pregnant. It's impossible. So it's like, if you have an accident and then you're like, I need the plan B pill. It's like, well, maybe you don't, don't take the plan B pill. If you don't need it, take it. If you need it, by all yeah. means, no judgment. Um, but maybe you don't need it. So that is just empowered, you know, you can be empowered that way. And then once you know your menstrual cycle and once you've been charting, then you can start practicing something called cycle thinking. And we have four phases of our menstrual cycle. So those two phases I talked about early follicular, which is pre-ovulation and luteal post-ovulation, we can even break them down even more into four phases. The first week is our menstrual cycle, our menstrual phase. Second phase, and that's anywhere from day one to seven, depending on how many days you bleed. When you stop bleeding, you enter your follicular phase. So let's say day five to 15, if you ovulate on day 15, then you have your ovulation phase, which is around day 14, 15, 16. It could be 18, 20 for some people. It really just depends. And one month is going to be different for you than another month because mm -hmm. things like stress can cause delayed ovulation and um, some women ovulate later. And then after you ovulate, you go into your luteal phase. So you have four, four phases uh, in the menstrual phase, you know, and, and how we can use these when cycle syncing each phase, our hormones are at different places. Our hormones ebb and flow. So depending on where our hormones are, it's gonna affect our mood, our appetite, our metabolism. And so if we know that, instead of fighting against our biology, be like, why am I so tired? And I don't right. feel like doing this hit workout right now. Or why am I so fatigued? Well, maybe a HIIT workout isn't supportive for your body where you are in your menstrual cycle. Maybe that salad that is, that is not appealing to you right now because you need something a bit more hearty because you're about to start your period and you're in your luteal phase. So it really helps you empower your body by adapting your, your exercise, your nutrition, um, your choices, your you know social engagement choices, workload, everything uh, in order to feel your best mm -hmm. and maximize your strengths and, and be resilient to maybe the weaknesses at certain phases of our cycle. So, you know, a classic example would be that in our, um, you know, luteal phase leading up to, to menstruation, we fatigue easier. Yeah. So, you know, if you have a static schedule, a very linear static schedule, it's like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I do orange theory, or I do the crazy hit CrossFit, which is great at some points of your cycle, but you know, only every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and no changes, no exceptions. Well, you know, if you do that workout in your luteal phase, your body's going to view it as a stressor mm. and it's going to cause you to break down muscle, which we don't want and store fat because your cortisol levels are going to increase and then cause you uh, to fatigue easy, uh, you know, have, have, have low energy the rest of your day. If you overwork too much in that phase, whereas that same workout in your follicular phase, so leading up to ovulation, you know, after you've, you've menstruated and you're in your follicular phase. Oh my gosh, your body will thrive on that. You'll have yeah. so much endurance and it will be a great workout for you because the high levels of estrogen and testosterone in that phase help you build muscle easier and burn fat yeah. and you don't fatigue as easy. So, um, it's just kind of working with our biology instead of against it. And do you recommend with women for women with PCOS or endometriosis who already mm -hmm. have hormonal disorders to really, um, to really like sink into cycle syncing? 
Absolutely, because it can help regulate our hormones mm-hmm. in our cycle. So especially with women with PCOS and endometriosis and even women who aren't having their periods who have, you know, for some reason, amenorrhea for, you know, a, there's a variety of reasons, right. but by maybe going with the cycle of the moon, you know, yeah. and following cycle syncing with the moon cycles, you can start to establish that rhythm in the body and bring back your period. This is so helpful, Jenna. Thank you so much. You've Mm -hmm. really made it so easy to understand these issues that I think are so important. I really appreciate it. This is amazing. Um, I realize we're coming to our hour, which I'm like, wow. Um, But before I let you go, is there anything that you want to share or questions or topics that we haven't covered that you think are really important to cover right now? You know, I, I just, I can't emphasize enough the importance of charting our cycles. It's so important. It should be something that we check in on every day, just like you check the weather or you check, you know, whatever it is, your email, right? Mm -hmm. You know, your email, who's emailed me today. It should also be something, what day of my cycle am I on charting those symptoms, any, any uh, symptoms that you have throughout your cycle, because you forget. And if you Mm -hmm. have them charted, you can go back to them and reference them. Um, And it just is a way to just take control of your health and be in tune with your body. So just really want to emphasize that and how important and how easy it is to get started. You know, it's just baby steps. If it's just like, if you're listening to this today and you're like, I don't even know what day of my cycle I'm on, uh, when my last cycle was okay, just start small, download an app and put in the day of your last period. Or if you don't know that the day when you start your next period, but day one, and then just start there, you know, baby steps. Yeah. Baby steps is it- it's a perfect place to start. And as you learn, you can increase and improve and reach out and get tested, et cetera. Um, how do we connect with you? How can we connect with you? Um, I know you have a few courses. I don't know if they're courses or master classes. I'm not sure how you would define yeah. that. Um, where can we find well, you? Yeah, of course. So I'm at the period guru on Instagram. My website is jennalongoria.com and I have lots of free resources on there. I have a free period solutions masterclass you can tap into. I have a free uh, a pain-free period guide on my website as well, which also kind of discusses the four phases of the menstrual cycle and dives into a little bit of this. So there's a lot of uh, information on there if you're if this has intrigued you and you want to learn a little bit more. Wonderful. Um, my final question for you is what does it mean to be a wise consumer to you? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, to be a wise consumer to me means first of all, that you have the mindfulness of how that, um, you know, economic exchange is going to impact the rest of the world and having that mindfulness, because I think a lot of people, and I, re- I remember growing up, I never had that mindfulness. I didn't understand about the chain and the cause and effect and who is this supporting and, and what is this, is this, is is this going to make the world a better place with this purchase or is it going to help feed into a systematic issue that, you know, a pattern that we need to, to fix? So I think it's kind of bringing that mindfulness to it. And then I, I believe in voting with your dollars, to be honest, like that's my, my, that my favorite way of making an impact because with our money, we support companies who are doing good things. And if we support companies who are doing good things and trying to make the world a better place and supporting, treating people ethically, um, fair trade, all of these things. And, you know, especially when it comes to food Mm -hmm. and, you know, where a healthy animal is way different than a factory farmed animal is completely different than a animal that's, you know, grazing on the grass freely. um, And it's going to be more nourishing to your body. So that's what it means to be a wise consumer, you know, making the best economic choice, you know, with your purchase uh, in order to make the world a better place. Absolutely. Thank you. And it is like a cycle too. Like if you're supporting a healthy animal, it's in the end going to also support you, which allows mm-hmm. you to continue supporting, you know, the businesses, the, if you want to be an activist and that's really like to go to the root of like the whole mission for the podcast is really like, you feel good, you can do good. Um, which is why hormones are so important to me. And I really appreciate you sharing this because I, I, I want women to take care of themselves, to feed themselves so they can t- continue supporting businesses that are doing good, continue supporting causes they truly care about and make a difference in our world. Um, so Jenna, thank you so very much. Um, this has been so enlightening and amazing. I really appreciate this conversation and I'm really sorry for your loss. Um, I keep lifting you up and I wish you the best in your journey and um, thank you for all the work you're, you're doing and, the, and supporting women. 
Thank you so much for having me on, Madeline. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. All right, friend, that about wraps it up. But this convo does not have to end here. I would love to hear from you. So please send your questions and comments my way. And if there's a topic you want to hear more about, send me a DM on Instagram at the wise consumer or email me at hello at the wise and let's chat. In the meantime, could I ask you to do me a huge favor, please? I'd really appreciate it if you could take a few minutes out of your day to subscribe to my show and leave me a review if you haven't already. You can do so in the iTunes app. It's that purple icon that comes preloaded on most smartphones, but I've also linked it up in the show notes if you're not sure how to access it. Anyway, that wraps it up for today. So until next time, friend, be safe, stay healthy, and take care. Hi, friends. As always, just ending this episode with my obligatory disclaimer. Please remember, the wise consumer is intended for educational purposes only. The content being shared here should not be used as a substitute for professional care by your healthcare provider. I am not a qualified medical expert, nor do I pretend to be. So please note that the content and research I share and explore on this podcast is not intended to treat or diagnose you. If you have any medical questions, concerns, or wish to make changes to your diet, please speak to your physician or any qualified healthcare professional for that matter. The wise consumer may not be held responsible for your health, dietary, or lifestyle decisions. I am simply here to encourage you to seek healthier, more eco-friendly, and conscious alternatives. While the Wise Consumer Podcast offers information from many sources, the opinions expressed are solely those of the wise consumer and not those of any affiliate or other entity. Additionally, while I always do my best to source and research the most up-to-date and accurate information, I realize science is continually evolving. If you come across any scientific information that is blatantly incorrect, please kindly email me at hello at thewiseconsumer.com. And finally, this podcast and any other offerings of The Wise Consumer may contain copyrighted material, the use of which has not always been specifically authorized by the copyright owner because it is being used for educational purposes. If you wish to use copyrighted material from this podcast or any other offerings of The Wise Consumer for purposes of your own that go beyond fair use, you must obtain permission from the copyright owner.